Please take your Bible. Let's turn together to uh, the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is given, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you now and we seek your Holy Spirit. Father, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. And what we are not, make us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, this is uh, the fourth Sunday of Advent. You say that's a brilliant observation on your part. Thank you very much. Uh, During this season of the year, during this Christmas season, we've been looking at the four titles given to Christ in Isaiah 9, 6. And if you're doing the math, uh, for Sunday in Advent, four titles, we should be on the fourth title, Prince of Peace. Okay, but pop quiz, guess who wasn't here one Sunday, the second Sunday of Advent? That was the preacher. He had gone up to see his granddaughter in her little Christmas play, so... We're going to look at the fourth title, the Prince of Peace, next Sunday, the 29th. So that's why we're only on the third one. So this morning we'll be looking at the title, Everlasting Father. Once again, I ask you to notice uh, there are two parts to each title, and just as before, we will look at each part of the title in turn. So this morning, Everlasting Father. And I was, as I was pondering, you know, the fact the reality, the truth that Jesus is the everlasting Father. I came across a sermon by a fella, and he talked about this truth in connection with the passing of George H.W. Bush, which was, if you'll recall, just a year ago, this past November the 30th. I remember watching that on television. Did you all see that? Did you all watch that? Um, I don't think anybody could have watched President George W. Bush give his father's eulogy without getting a lump in their throat. To see the son who who was himself a former president choking up and grieving the loss of his father, George H. W. Bush, uh, he was a one-term president. He was the most powerful man in the world. And his son, George W. Bush, a two-term president most powerful man in the world, and he's standing over his father's coffin delivering the eulogy for all of the power and for all of the influence that these two men had. It was temporary. It was fleeting. Death is the great leveler, if you will. This is an illustration of how uh, how fragile we are. And I understand that... Uh, this isn't a very festive illustration to give on a, on a Christmas morning on a Christ, in, during the Christmas season, but it sets the stage, I believe, for us understanding what it means that Jesus is the everlasting Father. Isaiah, in the first six verses of this chapter, of the ninth chapter, is, he's, he's sounding for us notes of hope 
and notes of joy, isn't he? He's telling us that the people who sat in darkness, they will what? They will see a great light. In place of sorrow and anguish, they will, there will be rejoicing. In place of war and oppression, there will be liberty. There will be freedom and peace. And all of this happens, why? Because of verse 6, for unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born, and the government will be on his shoulders. Not, and because of the coming of this baby, because he is born there in Bethlehem, everything changes. Everything's transformed. And it's because he is the everlasting father. You see, just like President Bush, all of the kings of Judah had perished. Every descendant of David had died. But here is Isaiah telling us about an heir to David's throne who will break the cycle. You look there at verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth, not for four-year term or for two terms, but forevermore. There's a king coming, Isaiah tells us, whose reign will never end. There will be no state funeral for this king. This child will rule and reign everlastingly. We watched George W. Bush weep for his father. There was national mourning. I remember that the flags across the country flew at half mast. And many of you, many of us, have stood at the graveside of a loved one, of a family member, and we've shed a tear. We've wept uh, ourselves. Many of us during this holiday season, we feel afresh. We feel anew the sting of, of old grief, and it comes back to us, and we miss those who have gone ahead of us. But this king, do you see what's coming here? This king defeats death. He's an everlasting king. He reigns everlastingly. Here's somebody that you can go to after the presents are opened and before Christmas dinner, and it's there during those quiet moments when all the memories coming come flooding back to you, and you can remember, you can hold on to the truth that Christ is the everlasting Father. He is ruling, He is reigning, and He has defeated death. Here's someone you can go to who, by His own death, and by his own resurrection has brought life and immortality to life. He has triumphed over the grave. He is the resurrection and the life. And anyone who lives and believes in him will not die, but they will have everlasting life, Christ says. He's the everlasting one. And he gives life to all who rest in him. You can look at death, you can look at grief, and you can look at loss, and you can stare it in the face, and you can say, you lose because Christ has won. He is the everlasting Lord. Beloved, albeit through tears, we can find hope and peace in the face of our grief. Well, what about the second part of the title? He's not only everlasting, he's the everlasting Father. And we have to be careful here. We have to be very careful here. We know that the scriptures describe Jesus as the divine son. He's the son of God. If he's the son of God, how can he be described as father as well? And this leads us head on into the doctrine of the blessed holy trinity. And we have to be careful here. We have to avoid venturing into heresy at all cost. And however, you'll be relieved to know that I'm not going to take the time to uh, expound upon the various heresies of the early church that are alive and well even today. You know, uh, instead of telling you about false doctrines, let's remind ourselves of the truth. Sort of like a United States Treasury agent. You know what they do, don't you? They familiarize themselves so much with the real deal, with real currency, that the, the moment they see false currency... It's easy because they know it's not the real thing. So let's look at the truth. We, as believers in Christ, we confess along with the scripture, along with the historic church, in all places down through the ages, we confess that God is one singular undivided being. He eternally exists in three distinct persons, the Father, 
and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. But the Father is not the Son or the Spirit. The Son is not the Spirit or the Father. And the Spirit is not the Father or the Son. Yet these three are one God. One in substance, equal in power and glory. One God, three distinct persons. Now as I see your eyes glaze over, that's why we didn't talk about all those things. That makes your head spin. And you say, well, okay, but if that's right, and I'm here to tell you that that is right, this is right, what does Isaiah mean when he calls Jesus the everlasting Father? I think it means three things. Three things. First, this is a word of tenderness to us, a word of affection to us. Jesus is a Father who cares for his people. Psalm 103 in verses 13 and 14, we can read there, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Jesus is full of a father's compassion. And why? And that's why he came. Compassion sent him, compassion for the lost, compassion for us. Compassion sent him on that first Christmas day to be born of a virgin. And we see this compassion moving and motivating Jesus in everything that he did. You don't have to turn to all these passages because we're going to be going a little quickly here, but you can write them down. For example, in Luke 7.13, in Luke 7.13, it's the story of the widow of Nain, who has lost her only son. And Luke tells us that when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. He said, do not weep. And then he raises her son from the dead. As a side note, if you read the scripture, you'll notice that Jesus never went to funerals. He only attended resurrections. You know, that's his compassion. That's his love toward us. Then there's Matthew 9, 36. Whenever Jesus, wherever he went, Vast crowds followed him and he, uh, to hear him preach. And Matthew says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed, they were helpless, and they were like sheep without a shepherd. And who does Jesus say that he is? What does he call himself in John 10? He says that he is the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He calls his flock, he calls his sheep by name. He leads them in, he leads them out. He finds good pasture for them, pasture for their souls. Isaiah 40, 11, we read there that he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. He loves the sheep. Are you one of his sheep? He loves them. He is a father who cares, who is full of compassion, who is full of tenderness toward his children. Now, there are those among us who might have or still do have a difficult relationship with their earthly father. And psychologists tell us that this can lead to having a negative outlook toward God the Father that a person will see God in a negative light when he is referred to as as Father. And I have no doubt that this is true for a lot of folks. It makes perfect sense. Now, with what I'm about to say, I don't want to undermine the reality of that or discount anybody's situation or feelings about their relationship or lack of relationship with their earthly father. But I don't believe that this thinking can be applied to every person who has has or did have a negative relationship with their earthly father because I think the very opposite can happen. And I say that because that's what happened to me. Okay, I I grew up with an abusive, alcoholic father. And you know what? There was nothing more wonderful to me in the world than to look at the scripture and see that there's a father there who loves me no matter what I do. There's a father there who always keeps his promises, who always cares, who always is there. He never leaves me. He will never forsake me. What a wonderful father our God is. And that's who Jesus is. 
He is the everlasting Father. He is that Father that sees all of your sin and loves you in spite of your sin. He loves you in the mess you're in. He loves you in the confusion that you're in. He loves you in the mistakes that you make and the disobedience that you stumble through. He loves you. He cares for you. Like a perfect father, full of compassion for you, you have a perfect Savior in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a father to the fatherless. There are no orphans in the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. His love never fails. It never runs out. His love never goes cold. It's never withdrawn. He loves you. And we can call him father in the sense that a father loves his people. Jesus loves his people. That's the first thing. Second, we can assign the title Everlasting Father to Jesus because he reveals the Father to us. He reveals the Father to us. We know God the Father by knowing Jesus Christ. If you want to, you can take your Bible and we can turn to John's Gospel, the first chapter, John 1, 18. It reads there, No one has ever seen God The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. The only begotten of God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. And then you turn over a few pages to John 14. John 14, beginning in verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Then you go to verse 8, where Phil, where, and there's Philip, who's not unlike me, and maybe he's not unlike you, and all of this stuff gets you real confused in your mind, and you can relate to what he's doing. So what he asks here, he asks in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and it will be enough for us. And then Jesus answers, And this is where where I find it very helpful is Jesus' answer. Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Jesus is not the Father, but he reveals the Father. He makes the Father known. There is no way to come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. You can't know the Father apart from knowing Christ. You see the Father when you look at Christ. He reveals the Father to us. To us, to see him is to know the Father. So let's be done with this vague and ill-defined God talk that's all around us as if there were no need to qualify anything to pass muster for being a Christian. I mean, you know, to incorporate God in some vague sense into our conversation, that's supposed to make us a believer in Christ. A perfect example of this, of what I'm talking about, was uh, I watched a lot of those conference championship games, you know, in college, and they all they had that Dr. Pepper thing, you throw the footballs into the thing, and they, the kids win $100,000 for school. I think that's a wonderful thing. I think that's a great thing for kids to do this. And they asked one young man after he had won this $100,000 scholarship, and, and they asked him how he felt about all of this, and he said that he thanked God that he had won this money and that he wanted everybody to know God's love and the blessing of God's love, and all that sounds really good, doesn't it? it sounds really good. But if you know your Bible and you understand the culture and the times that we are living in, There's a great big problem here with that statement. What's the problem? Not one word about Christ. Not one word about Jesus Christ. We live in a day and age where it says, doesn't matter what path you're on, all paths lead to God. That's intellectual suicide. I mean, we have totally different beliefs. The Jews say that Jesus is not the Messiah. Guess what we say? We say he is the Messiah. The Hinduism says there are multiple incarnations of God. What does Christianity say? There is only one incarnation of God, the incarnate Son of God that was born in the manger at Bethlehem. 
That's huge difference. Huge difference. So this kid, there was no proclamation of the reality that the only way to God is through Jesus Christ, that it is Christ and Christ alone who reveals the Father. I'm not saying that this young man was intentionally trying to mislead anybody. I'm not saying that he wasn't sincere. I have no doubt that he was sincere. But sincerity has never brought salvation to anyone. There are very sincere people who have believed false doctrine who are in hell this morning. Beloved, there are people, what I'm trying to say, the Bible is clear. Historic Christianity is clear. Jesus himself is clear. Just read it. I just read it to you. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what it says. And I'm not saying to be mean. I'm not saying to be rude. I'm not saying to be arrogant. But this is what we have to proclaim. The Christian message is that God the Father has revealed himself to the world uniquely and climactically in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The message is, is that you can come and know the Father by grace, through faith, in the baby of Bethlehem, in the man of Calvary. There's no such thing, no such thing as a Christless Christianity. If you rob Jesus of his deity, however pleasant, however kind you may be, you're not a Christian. There are many so-called churches that have stripped Jesus of his deity and they've reduced their message to empty platitudes and an ill-defined message about God and what they have to offer you this morning is just sentiment and social work. Let's not be deceived. What I'm trying to tell you is what you believe matters. What you believe really matters. That's why you have to know your Bible. Oh, just whatever. No, it's not whatever. What you believe matters. The message of Christmas, the message of the Christian gospel is that God himself has come to us in Jesus of Nazareth and made himself to us, made himself known to us in Mary's child. The Son reveals the Father. He is the everlasting Father. Not just by way of tenderness and not just by way of His affection to us, but also by way of His revelation. Jesus reveals the Father. Now just think about that. Just ponder it for a minute. You're, you're intelligent people. The, the one Isaiah calls everlasting Father is Mary's child. Everlasting Father cradled in her arms, everlasting Father laid in a manger. Our joy as Christians only makes sense if into the darkness of this sinful world the light of life has shined. Very God of very God, begotten not made, the divine Son of God reveals the Father. He is the wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And we have to insist on it. As I said before, you don't have to be mean, but we have to be loving, we have to be firm, and insist upon the truth of Scripture. It's a word of tenderness. It's a word of revelation. And thirdly, this is our last point. Can I get an amen? It's a word of adoption. It's a word of adoption. I invite you to turn to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4, beginning in verse 4. It's a word of adoption. Galatians 4, 4 talks about the first Christmas this way. But when the fullness of time had come, at just the right time, at the exact moment, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son. That's Christmas, isn't it? God sending his son. When the fullness of time had come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that, and here's the point, here's Paul's point about Christmas, to redeem those under the law so that we may receive adoption as sons, as daughters. That's why he came. That's why he came that first Christmas. Christmas, so that orphans may come into the family of God. And friends, we are all orphans. Why? Because we are all sinners. And our sin alienates us from God. And so Jesus came to secure our adoption. 
Now, how do you get to be an adopted son of God? How do you get to be an adopted daughter of God? Well, we got to bounce back to the Gospel of John. You know, you wish, make up your mind, preacher. But Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12. Chapter 1, verse 12 of John's Gospel says this. To all who received him, to all who received him, who believed in his name, God gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of whose will? God's. That's what it says. So how do you get to be, uh, become a child of God, adopted into his family? You believe. You believe. You entrust yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do, you'll be able to say with, with John with the apostle, who joyously and amazingly and wondrously exclaims in his letter, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, Behold what manner of love God has bestowed upon us. Why? That we might become, that we are called the children of God. And such we are. John's amazed. Why is he amazed? He's amazed and he is astonished that a good, righteous, pure, and holy God would redeem Whole, uh, unholy, rebellious sinners like me and like you. John is blown away by that, that we would receive the uh, sonship, that we would be adopted, that we would be the heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. So there's a word of tenderness here. Jesus is like a father with compassion to his children. He loves you. He loves you. You are beloved by an everlasting Father, an everlasting Lord with an everlasting love. There's a word of revelation here. Jesus shows you the Father. You want to know God's heart towards you? Read the Gospels. Look at the Gospels. Look at the life of Christ. You see him, the very picture of frailty, the very picture of vulnerability, a baby born in a manger to a, there to Mary. Then you see him preaching compassion to the crowds, healing the sick. Then you see him bearing his cross through the streets of Jerusalem as the crowds spit on him, mock him. Then you see him nailed to that cross, and what does he do? He prays for his murderers from the cross. Then three days later, you see him rise again, and then he ascends to glory. What does this story proclaim to you? It says that the Father's heart beats with love for you. And he did it all that you might become adopted children of God. He wants to show you what God is like. But more than that, he wants to bring you into the family of God, to make you a child of God by grace through faith. Whatever your earthly family is like, whatever griefs or joys, you will know because of your family this Christmas, I implore you by the mercies of God, do not remain an orphan from the family of God any longer. Why? Because he sent his son. He sent his son to bring you to himself. Whoever believes in his name, to them he gives the right to become children of God. Won't you trust him today? Trust him today. Give yourself to him today and forever. Why is it forever? Because he's an everlasting father, an everlasting savior, a perfect savior. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, how we praise you. Everlasting father who reigns and knows no end. Your compassion overflows. You've given yourself for us to make us children of God. How we bless you and praise you for you, for, for revealing yourself to us as the everlasting Father. You have revealed to us the Father's heart, the Father's character, the Father's tenderness and his compassion. Lord Jesus, may each and every one of us bow down before you. Send your Holy Spirit to us and bring us to a point in our life that we would come clean at last, Father, at long last, about the emptiness of life lived on our own terms, doing things our own way. Bring us to a place of repentance. Help us to turn the reins of our lives over to you, Lord Jesus. 
over to your rule, to your kingship, so that as we trust in you, may we receive the right to become children of God, children born not of blood, not of the will of man, nor the will of the flesh, but born indeed of God. We ask all of this in your precious name. Amen. Yeah.